What is going on, Alpha Males? Welcome to the Alpha Male Podcast. The podcast where we talk about what it means to be a man the right way, strong, made in the image of God, and don't apologize, making godly men strong, and making strong men godly. Now, today's episode, survive. It's a verb, not a noun. Intrigued? Hopefully you'll stay tuned for the rest of the episode. With that, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't thus far. I'll plug in the bio if you want to skip it. Skip around 3 minutes and 45 seconds. And if you want to check out more, as always, goodshepherdtraining.com. Who am I? A question we should all ask ourselves. I am, first and foremost, a servant of God, made in His very own image. A follower of of Jesus Christ. A simple man called by God to the Great Commission to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Next, a little bit about my background and what God has allowed me to do and blessed me to do in life. Grew up what most would consider very poor in the backwoods of the southeastern and mid-Atlantic United States, hunting and fishing. Joined the Marine Corps at 17. Did a couple of combat tours in Iraq. So a decorated Marine Corps combat veteran. Infantry assaultman. After the combat tours, I was an urban warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. I also served in the U.S. Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. Also a veteran of law enforcement. I served with LAPD. I was a sworn peace officer, a cop for LAPD. I worked regular patrol assignments and more specialized assignments. One of those more specialized assignments was warrant service, fugitive recovery. Also had some other law enforcement roles. I am an FBI certified firearms instructor and been certified by another three-letter government agency in a lot of firearms and training things. I've also been a private contractor, worked in the private sector, pertaining to tactics and gunfighting and Protecting America from enemies foreign and domestic. I served as the commander of a tactical team to stop active shooters in a large metropolitan area. That was our primary mission, to stop active shooters, which sadly are a thing in America today. I've also been blessed to do quite a bit of competition shooting. Started my first formal competitions even before joining the Marine Corps at 17. I had one more shooting competitions than I can remember. I have competed in all manner of disciplines in shooting. I've been blessed to be a state rifle and pistol champion, West Coast regional champion. Like I said, been blessed to win more shooting competitions than I can remember. I mentioned hunting. I've hunted to put meat on the table starting when I was a child. I've also been a professional big game hunter and guide, hunting and slaying all manner of beast. And I don't apologize for that. Humbled to be the host of three podcasts. Simple Man Sermons, Alpha Male Podcast, and Gumfighter Life. Obviously, as things not mentioned, I've been blessed to do many other things. But, again, first and foremost, I'm a servant. A servant of God, a believer and follower of the Bible, the Word, Jesus Christ. And I don't apologize for that. With that, let's transition into today's topic. Survive. Survive is a verb. It's an action word. It's a doing of something. 
It's a continuing of something. It's not a kit you order on Amazon. It's not a 250 piece kit, one and done. And I think too often here in the Western world, in the affluent Western culture, Western society, it's so tempting to get on Amazon and just buy something and think you're good. I see this, and survive encompasses a lot. It encompasses the tactical aspects, which I'm quite familiar with, as you probably know if you listen to the bio at least once. It also has to do with primitive skills and hunting and all manner of things. There's a ton of skills encompassed in survive. Survive, survival, survivalism, survivalist, they all come from the root word, survive, which is a verb. Again, it's not a thing that you buy. It's not a one and done kind of thing. Just because you buy the same piano that Billy Joel has, that doesn't mean you can play it like Billy Joel. Just because you go out and can afford and order on Amazon the nicest Fender Stratocaster, you know, electric guitar, that doesn't make you a rock star. Just because you can go out and buy a super cool bushcraft knife, that doesn't give you the ability to make a shelter in the woods. It gives you a tool that you can apply that ability to, to make a shelter in the woods. Just because you can buy a nice scoped 308 rifle that's great for hunting, doesn't make you a hunter. Just because you have an AR and a plate carrier, that doesn't make you a warrior. Does it make you survive? Because again, that's an action. Survive is a verb. So one of the reasons I don't really like the whole prepper thing, I use it because people understand it and know what it is, but... Growing up, it was a survivalist. You were a survivalist, somebody that practiced the art of surviving. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we let all this new speak and this Orwellian stuff shame us from using terms that are fine terms. Just like, oh, we don't want to use militia because it's got bad connotations. Like the next term you come up with, they're not just going to paint that as something else. How long did it take for them to take the term prepper and make that into a bunch of crazy people into in a lot of people's eyes right quit letting them define what terms mean a survivalist somebody that practices survival somebody that wants to survive and continues to survive there's nothing wrong with that so don't apologize for it much like there's certain categories of guns and for whatever reason people will like oh we don't want to use that term anymore we're going to use modern sporting rifle or they'll make up some term Stop making up terms. It's just, it's newspeak. You're letting somebody else define what something is when that's not what it is. If you're a group of modern Minutemen standing ready to fight against enemies foreign and domestic, then call yourself a militia and stand up tall and don't be ashamed of it. If you like to practice the fine art of survive, and I'm not going to apologize for drawing breath and hoping that no matter what comes economic boom or bust, feast or famine, that I'm going to be able to survive. And I'm not going to apologize for that, and I call myself a survivalist. That's what that is. And you shouldn't apologize for it either. But that encompasses more than just having kit and gear. And I think a lot of times today, just like a lot of people buy guns, and they never train with it, and they put it next to their bed or in a closet like a security blanket, like somehow just having it is going to make them ready. But it doesn't. Just like buying that Fender Stratocaster guitar. I know not the first thing about how to play a guitar. You give me that guitar and stand in front of me and tell me to play a Jimi Hendrix song. I don't care how much money you throw at me. I don't care how much other stuff you throw at me. I can't play a Jimi Hendrix song. That takes time and training. Much like many other things we're going to talk about today. Cool. You have an AR. You have the tool to apply the skill and ability to to help you in a survival situation whether that's a riot or civil unrest or economic breakdown but having that AR is just a thing 
That's a tool. That's a noun. Survive is a verb. Take action. Train. Be better. I think a lot of survivalists and preppers just have this idea in their head. Oh, you know, when the balloon goes up, I'm just going to bug out to the woods and hunt and and I'm going to be a neo, you know, hunter gatherer. Having never actually done it. And if they say this east of the Mississippi, I know for them it's probably a thought experiment because just simple math doesn't add up unless all but the rare survival scenarios and like there's an actual crazy high death rate pandemic. I'm talking like 90% of the population. Then maybe, yeah, there'll be plenty of deer around. But shy of that, most other scenarios, look at what happened to the deer population in the first year or two of the Great Depression. Look at what the population was in the Great Depression and look at what it is now. And you'll say, well, you know, everybody hunted back then, but they didn't. Plenty of people were city slickers back then and wore loafers and hats, you know, bowler hats and all that other stuff in the cities. So it, that's not a valid argument, I don't think. And then look at how many deer an adult mountain lion, which weighs roughly about the same as a human eats. I want to say it's around 50, give or take 50 deer every year for one mountain lion. Assuming that's half of your diet, what's 25 times every adult male and female east of the Mississippi and look at the deer population? So no, you're probably not doing that. You might use it to supplement, maybe, but probably so are a lot of other people, a lot of other people. And even if they don't know how to hunt right now, even a broken watch is right, you know, twice a day. And if nobody's working and things are that bad and everybody's out in the woods with a gun... Number one, do you want to be out in the woods with a gun, especially east of the Mississippi? You know, go on opening day on public land and and hunting season in a lot of places east of the Mississippi and see how that works out. And even if you have land, if you don't have a big fence around it and you can't defend it, I don't know that you can consider that your land. It's not like the deer know that that's your land and they're just going to stay there. So... Again, you just having this idea of I've got all this stuff and I've got this, you know, 250 piece kit, survival kit that I bought on Amazon and I've got this brand new backpack and a really cool bushcraft knife and I'm going to be good to go. Maybe not, man. Maybe not. You have to have the skills to go along with it. You have to have the verbs, the subverbs under survive. You have a handgun. Good. I think you should have a handgun. Do you train with it? Can you get it from where it's stored to in action in, let's say, under two seconds? Because look at, statistically, most civilian gunfights are started and finished in under three seconds. So if you haven't gotten your gun into action in, let's say, well under two seconds, you know, the odds that you're actually going to use that to defend yourself are very small. Again, it's not a security blanket. You having it doesn't really help you at all. I know I'm probably going to make a lot of people mad in this episode, but that's fine. I'd rather you get mad and repent and actually practice the skills. If you have a handgun, good. Practice using it. Be a rock star with that handgun. Be a rock star with that AR. Don't just have it there. Have it there and know how to make music with it. Be able to be a master with it. Be able to create a tactical symphony with that AR and that shotgun and that hunting rifle and that fighting handgun and that 22 long rifle, that, you know, core battery. Be able to make some beautiful survival music with that. From the tactical to the practical, anything from, you know, CQB, to hunting, to dispatching an animal caught in a snare. Be able to do that. I just touched on snares. I have been a professional hunter, if you listen to the bio, and a professional trapper. That was part of it. You know, this is a quintessential one. You think that you having a snare or having snare wire means that you can snare an animal? You're sorely mistaken. Snaring is hard. Trying to figure out where that animal is going to be at a certain time in the future and getting them to step in a certain place. 
That's hard. Go talk to any professional trapper and see how many traps they run. Especially moving into a new area, not an area that's established where they know the snares are going to be successful or the conibear traps are going to be successful. But ask them, they go into a new area, never trapped there before, how many traps they set versus how many animals they catch. Go talk to a professional that does this professionally. So they know what to look for. They know the signs. They know what their quarry eats. They know its movement habits. They know what their footprints look like in the woods. They know an old trail that hasn't been used in a while versus a trail that gets used all the time. Ask them how many snares they run per animal. And how many snares do you keep in your you know, bug out bag? And again, I'm not telling you not to have snares and snare wire in your bug out bag. I think you should. But you likewise should know how to use it. Do you think it's a good time to learn how to snare when you haven't eaten in three days and you're bugged out to the woods? Real quick aside before I forget, I often give tactical tips, but I could use some tactical help from the audience. Where does the term bug out come from? Tell me. I don't know. I remember hearing it. I know it's in military circles. I was obviously in the military. I've heard it. But where does a bug out come from? What What is that term? Where does that vernacular hail from? If you know... Let me know. I'd love to know. I know where balloon when the balloon goes up. I believe that's from World War One, right before a battle would commence. They would literally send up balloons to observe and see kind of the battlefield. So when the balloon went up, you know things were about to get crazy. So I know where that term comes from. You know when I say when the peanut butter and chocolate hits the fan. You know what that refers to? How most people say that, and that just means a you know a giant mess. I know where that term comes from. It's easy to deduce. But bug out? What, you know, where does that come from? If anybody knows where that originated, I'd love to know. So either leave it in the comments so we can all know or contact me at goodshepherdtraining.com. There's a contact link on there. But I'd love to know where that comes from. Anyway, the time to learn how to run a snare or to run a trot line for fish is not when you haven't eaten in three days and you just bugged out and your house has been burned down and your kids are hungry, right? You should know how to do that now. So that even if you're half as as effective because whatever, you're dehydrated, you're hungry, that you can do it. I've been recently been doing this. You listen to my bio, I've had to spend large chunks of my life in the city. By God's grace now, in an effort to get these podcasts doing better, I thought about that critically and thought, what's one of my biggest expenses and how can I get rid of that to focus on trying to get the podcast to be self-sustainable to support doing it full time? My biggest expense was rent. So how do I cut that out? I go live off grid. Now, no worries. I've lived off grid plenty in my life before. I grew up super poor in the South and I also spent quite a bit of time overseas fighting wars and things like that and Living off-grid now as a civilian is certainly way better than that, even if you take out the part of getting shot at. Just the conditions and the food are way better. So I've been doing that, so I get quite a bit of practice at it. But I identify even myself, even though growing up hunting and being a professional hunter and spending I don't know how many nights outside or in the woods or off-grid, I still have a weak point in what I would call primitive skills, so I've been trying to work on that. I have spent quite a bit of time outside in the woods, in the forest, on the rivers with my wife, who likes to do this when she's not working, and go out and forage and learn plants and learn all that kind of foraging. So I'm not just, you know, telling you guys to do stuff that I don't do. You know, I, the tactical stuff, I dare call myself blessed by God to be a master at that, to be an expert shooter, an expert rifleman, an expert at a pistol not call myself an expert at making natural cordage per se. That was one of the skills I was practicing today, right before this podcast. Going out and finding plants and making natural cordage. Now I do carry cordage as part of my EDC, stuff that goes in my pocket. 550 cord and Spectra, which is super strong, super lightweight cordage. That's part of my everyday carry that goes in my pocket. But it's important to know how to make more out of natural things. And I was practicing that today. You know what? I wasn't very good at it because it's the first time I practiced it fairly good at tying knots and things like that and braiding so that helped but even so i would not want to have to rely on that cordage that i made today and the amount of time it took if i was making natural shelter now i carry some in my pocket like i said and i carry more of my packs my 
bailout bag that we've talked about, my baby bug out bag, and my big bug out bag. But what if I need more? Should probably learn how to make it. I've been trying to focus on that this year. I've been trying to focus on the wild edibles with my wife. We've found quite a few plants. And one of the things I've learned about the collecting of wild edibles is a lot of things that look really delicious can kill you or toxic, will make you really sick somewhere on that spectrum. And some of the things that look downright weird and disgusting are good for you and you can eat them. So looking at a plant, the fact that it looks delicious is by no means indicative of whether or not you can or should eat it. Of all the who knows how many types of mushrooms I've seen, I think I feel comfortable eating one of the kinds of mushrooms. And that's after a lot of study. Because it really doesn't have anything else that looks even close to it. Most mushrooms, unless you really, really know them, have one or two variants that look like it but are toxic, even deadly. But just going back to the things like berries. You know, just outside where I'm talking to you right now, there are a ton of edible berries. I went foraging yesterday. I literally, there's all kinds of blackberries, different kinds of blackberries. Also found currants. Also found huckleberries, which are probably my favorite. But right outside my door, there's a berry that looks really good. And it's nightshade. It's toxic, maybe even deadly, depending on how much you eat. It looks delicious. Also, the other day I was out foraging. We found quite a large quantity of rose hips. And even though we were familiar with them, they looked a little bit different than what we're used to. We it sure we verified again that they were in fact rose hips because they were a lot larger than any rose hips that we had ever seen. But we ate some. They were delicious. But looking at that plant, looking at that thing, you would think it's probably not edible. And even when you bite into it, it doesn't really look like any other edible plant that you would eat. But they're delicious and packed full of vitamin C. I think one serving has something like 900% of your daily vitamin C. But again, you got to practice the skill. Because you're probably going to take a lot more risks, again, that scenario where you've been in the woods and you haven't eaten for a while. That's probably not the time to be like, I'm really hungry, that berry looks really good. Because I don't care how tactical you look. Literally, you know, dying of dysentery or dying of massive diarrhea is not tactical. I don't care how cool your kit is. If you don't have food, you're not very operationally effective. So know the skills, practice the skills. I might recast, as one of the recasts this week, the Manly Skills episode. But just a real simple example. You might have a ton of 550 cord, and I think you probably should have a bunch of 550 cord. But if you only know how to tie a pretzel knot, and your idea of a strong knot is tying three pretzel knots, you're not very effective with that 550 cord. Can you make a simple bowling knot? It's a knot that every man should know how to tie. Can you tie a constrictor knot? Can you tie a hitch? Can you tie some kind of slip knot and some kind of quick detach knot? Again, that's the difference between having something and actually being able to utilize it and know how to use it. Again, Something I've been practicing recently is getting better at building fire. And I've obviously built plenty of fires. And, you know, living in the Southwest, it was pretty, I kind of took it for granted, even living in like Idaho. It's not hard to find dry tinder. But in the Pacific Northwest, where I am now, it's not a given that you can find dry tinder in the rainforest, literally the rainforest. So I've been working on that, making fire with natural materials, holding it to just natural materials. Even using a ferro rod, which is part of my EDC. The first time I tried that, I thought, oh, this won't be that bad. I'm just going to try the skill real quick. Well, something like two and a half, three hours later, I finally got what you might be able to call a decent, sustainable fire. And maybe not even then. Well, I took that, slept on it, you know, got better at it. The next real time that I actually applied it and thought, you know, this is something I'm going to practice today, 30 minutes. And I had to dump water on it to get it out. That's the difference between having stuff and having skill and actually doing it. And that's the difference between having skill and having knowledge. I had the knowledge, but I didn't really have the techniques in applying it. 
I have a pretty cool, you know, survivalist library. You know, number one, the Bible. Then maybe some of your military field manuals. Survivalist books and manuals. Survival guns. Bushcraft stuff. I have the, let's say, the potential knowledge. Until I have that skill. Again, that book's probably not going to do me much good. I've just been running. And yeah, cardio is a survival skill. Probably one of your more important ones. When I've been running and I'm out in the woods and I have to build a fire or I'm going to freeze to death probably not the time to try and turn that knowledge into skill. I probably should have that skill. Going back to our main theme. Survive is a verb. It's an action word. It's not a noun. It's not a thing that I buy and click on Amazon and have it in two days. Now there's a place for some of that. Like you should probably have some ramen noodles stored up or whatever your survival food is that you want. Because it's a lot easier to buy that right now than it is to try and produce that or gather that off the land. There's a lot of calories in a case of ramen noodles that, well, this is recorded in September of 2022. Who knows what they'll cost, you know, in a couple of weeks with inflation. But right now, they're still probably under five bucks for a case of ramen noodles. Try going out and foraging even the luscious of environments and getting that many calories for that amount of work. Likewise, hunting. If you think that you're just going to go out when the balloon goes up, when the peanut butter and chocolate hits the fan, and hunt your way into survival, you know, paradise, can you hunt now? I know maybe somebody somewhere has hunted with their AR-15. Cool, have you done it? And have you done it regularly? Because I have. I've, I can't, I can't honestly figure if I tried to give you a number, an accurate number of how many living things I've killed with an AR. But I don't want that. I don't want to have to rely on hunting with an AR for food. Again, you're talking to somebody that spent quite a large portion of his life as a professional gunfighter running an AR-15 and been a professional hunter and guide. And I don't want to have to rely on an AR-15 for hunting. And I certainly wouldn't want to do that anywhere east of the Mississippi. Just simple math, population density is way too high. You know how to hunt? Cool. And I say this as somebody that's been part of this culture as a professional guide. People that have hunted many, many times. You're there to help them get an animal. And I like being a professional guide. But then you shoot the animal, or let's say they shoot the animal, the client shoots the animal, right? And hopefully I don't have to shoot it because they did a bad shot. Let's say they're competent with that. Let's say that you're from the South and you hunt. Do you actually butcher your own game? And not just that, do you have the skills to do that if there's no power? Because if you throw it in your truck, what if there's no gasoline and no trucks? Do you haul it back to your house and lift it up with some kind of mechanical device and then cut it up with a sawzall? What if you don't have that? Can you take that deer or that elk on the side of a mountain and preserve it? know how to butcher it and not just the common stuff like not just taking hindquarters and tenderloins i'm talking about getting a majority of the meat off of that and if times get tough like literally and i like the heart and the liver so i eat those anyway but eating most of the organs you know how to do that you know how to preserve those do you know how to crack open the bones to get the marrow because that's a big thing fat on most game animals is scarce and ask, you know, look at read old pioneer diaries and settler's diaries and trapper's diaries from, you know, days of yore. Fat was a big deal. A fatty animal and getting fat was a, was a hard thing in their diet. Do you know how to do that? Do you know how to render deer tallow, for instance? Because we talked about a lot of people that don't know how to hunt. They're still going to be out there in the woods and if they're hungry, they're going to shoot something. And if it's summertime, what they're probably going to do is sadly shoot the animal, take the hindquarters out, and the rest of it's going to spoil and rot. Because if they don't know how to make biltong and jerky, and if they don't have a massive amount of salt stored up or know how to get salt from a natural environment, foraging is more than just plants you can eat right now, plants that can help preserve meat and preserve food and keep bugs off of it. If they don't know that and it's just them and they shoot a deer, most of that deer is probably going to go to waste. I don't care how hungry they are. You can only eat so much deer in a day or two. And, you know, go shoot a deer or see a deer here on the side of the road in the south you know, the southeastern United States. And go drive past that deer two days later and tell me if you eat that thing. You shoot up, let's say, a 120-pound deer. That's pretty standard. East of the Mississippi in the summer in Georgia. The, the person that doesn't know all these skills. And there's no electricity. There's no 
know, you can't just put it in a freezer. How much of that deer do you think you're going to be able to eat before it goes bad? That's why, again, I, I don't just say, oh, I'm going to go hunt. Have you done it? Have you preserved meat? Have you made biltong? Did a whole other episode on preserving meat and making biltong. You might want to check that out if you plan on hunting as part of your survival plan. There's ways to get salt from certain plants. There's ways to get salt if you're near the coast. Obviously, salt water, seawater. You probably want to have that salt ready and go collect that water and brine it out and get what you want before you shoot the deer or else it's mostly going to go to waste. Without continuing on that rabbit hole, the fact that you have an AR and say you're going to be able to hunt, first of all, have you ever hunted with it? Second of all, do you know how many other people in your area, what's the population density? How many deer are there? How long do you think it's going to take with people shooting a few deer before the population is not viable to reproduce fast enough? You know, how many deer does a doe have in a season versus how many people are going to try and eat a deer that season? That's just simple math. You probably want to know what plants are edible in your area. You probably want to know what lamb's quarter looks like or whatever whatever grows in your area, right? You probably want to know the difference between a huckleberry and nightshade. Because they're both small little red delicious looking berries. And one is delicious and one is toxic. Going back to the bug out thing, have you ever actually bugged out? And some people are like, I would never bug out. Well, my wife and I bugged out actually. You can go listen to that episode also, Bug Out Actual, last year. This year? This year. We bugged out for real. Twice. Because of massive wildfires in Arizona. Look historically in cities, if you live in cities or suburbs, historically, before there was all this massive infrastructure, it wasn't uncommon for entire cities to burn down. The biggest city in this county where I'm in right now is Astoria. There's a mass of 10,000 people, I think, which is way better than I would like to be near. But even so, that entire town burnt down twice. Look at San Francisco and places like that. If the grid goes down, if things get that bad, If the entire city, that entire suburb, your entire subdivision is burning down, are you just going to be like, oh, I'm not bugging out. I'm a bug-in guy. I'm never going to bug out. Well, then have fun, you know, sitting in your burning down house with your AR and your plate carrier being super tactical because you can't shoot your way out of a, you know, a building fire. It's not how that works. Which do you do, bug in or bug out? Whichever one increases your chances to survive. That's the right answer to that equation. God blessed you with a wonderful brain. Use that reason and reason out. Which option gives you the better chance of survival? Are you going to defend your house to the to the very end? With your plate carrier and your AR. And I love plate carriers and ARs. I keep a plate carrier behind the driver's seat of my car. And I keep an AR behind the driver's seat of my car. It's one right there right now. That's a tool for certain applications. If you live in a suburb where you can see the next house, what if somebody's behind the wall of that next house and launching, you know, a Molotov cocktail tied to a rope? What are you going to do when your house catches on fire and there's two or three or four Molotov cocktails burning your house down? That's, you know, how hard is a Molotov cocktail to make? It's scarily easy and effective. What are you going to do then? They're just going to wait until everything burns down and come. Forget about your cold dead hands. What about your warm, you know, charred dead hands? So you probably want to bug out before then. You see a bunch of your neighbor's houses in whatever direction they're coming from getting burned down. Revelation 18, come out of from my people. But again, the first time you bug out shouldn't be the first time you have to bug out. My wife and I bugged out actually, like actually had to bug out last year, but that wasn't the first time we'd bugged out. We had literally bugged out and done dry runs before. We had a designated bug out location that we both knew and we went there. And we had lived there before in off grid in the wilderness. We knew where we were going. We knew how to get there. We had to choose which of the two routes we had pre-designated. But we went there. That wasn't the first time we had bugged out. We had done it before, even if just for recreation. We had a plan. I do believe, sadly, people died in that fire, at least the first one. Because they stayed too long. They waited to bug out. Bugging out is not a noun. It's not a bag that you buy on Amazon and a bunch of cool kit that you buy. 
bugging out is an action. You have to do it. You have to know how to do it. You have to be willing and ready to do it. Combat. Verb. Take action to reduce or prevent something bad or undesirable. Take action. Combat is an action. Again, you know, having the stuff doesn't make you the thing. Having the nicest set of snap-on tools does not make me a master diesel mechanic. Having a super expensive Fender Stratocaster does not make me a rock star. Having an AR-15 and a Glock 19 and a plate carrier does not make you a gunfighter. And having a bug out bag does not make you survive. Survive is a verb. It's an action word. So take action. Practice whatever you need to evaluate on and become stronger at. Shooting is a perishable skill. I practiced making natural cordage earlier today. I plan on practicing my gunfighting skills and abilities to keep those sharp when I'm done recording this, as I generally do every day except for Sabbath. On Sabbath, I rest. But six days I shall labor, and the seventh day I shall rest. Six days, God willing, I will practice those martial skills and those combat skills. I did this even when I was in the city, even when I was a professional and a super high paying corporate management job, I still practiced my dry firing every day. There's no excuse. You live in a city, go for a walk outside. Go find plants in your area. I don't care where you are. Even in like New York City, you can find a plant. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it edible or inedible? Is it useful for anything? Can you make cordage out of it? Can you use it to keep insects away? Any number of things. You have a super cool bushcraft knife. Awesome. I like really cool knives. Can you skin a deer with it? Is there any blood on it at all? Start with a fish if you know you live in a city. Go buy a whole fish and scale it and gut it and fillet it. Get the skill. Start there. Practice the things. You have a super good knife, good. It should be a little bit dirty. Can you make a feather stick with it? Can you start a fire with it and a fire steel? Again, you have a handgun, great. Carry it. Carry it loaded. Be able to get it from where you keep it to in action, getting hits on target. I would say in well, well under two seconds. That's not an inachievable goal. Again, because that gun is not a security blanket, friend. The fact that you have it does not keep bad people away. The fact that you can run it. The fact that you can master that skill and be a rock star with it. Make music with it. That's useful. That's valuable. That can help you survive. Anyway, with that, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. And I know that the gear episodes do really well, and I plan on doing more gear episodes. In fact, I think a gear episode dropped this week. But don't fall into that affluent American mindset that just because you can order something on Amazon, something really good, could order a knife on Amazon today that would make the trappers and long hunters and pioneers of our ancestors of just 100 years ago or 200 years ago it would blow their mind how nice a good you know S35VN powdered metallurgy super steel. You know how much Lewis and Clark would have liked to have that on their Expedition West? Just because you can have that really, really good knife far better than anything they had doesn't mean that you'd be able to complete the Lewis and Clark Expedition. It doesn't mean that you could survive it. Look at the handguns available and Wyatt Earp stay. I realize Wyatt Earp used the best tools he had for the time. I dare say he used the best tools that gave him the best chance of survival. He didn't use it for nostalgia. Modern day Wyatt Earp is not going to use a single action army or whatever he used. I'm not a, a western gunfighter history buff. If he was around today, he's going to use the best tool for the job, a staccato. 
or a Colt Combat Elite or an M17 or whatever. Just because you can have a better gun today than Wyatt Earp had then, that doesn't make you Wyatt Earp. Again, survive is an action word, so take action. Do, practice, develop. Anyway, with that, I'm going to start wrapping up this episode. As a thanks for staying tuned, I'll throw out a tactical tip of the day. Don't forget to check out goodshepherdtraining.com, goodshepherdtraining.com. If you like this work, if you think the men need to hear this is an important message, the way it gets out there is by the grace of God and support from viewers like you. So if you want to support goodshepherdtraining.com, there's a Patreon link on there, and hopefully I'll just remember to put a Patreon link in the show notes. Patreons get all kind of cool content. We get to help each other out. A lot of us talk on a daily basis. Not just that, but you get some really cool insider content. I've been posting several videos, a lot of which are shooting training videos, talking about that skill, being things you can practice and tips and things like that from what God's blessed me to learn to pass that on to other men to make them better. Anyway, Patreons get that and a lot of that video content. I've been putting out several videos the last couple of weeks. Some of those are just for patrons. Some of those for everybody if you want to check those out. Again, goodshepherdtraining.com and click on the Patreon link. Some of that stuff you'll be able to watch whether you're a Patreon or not. A patron or not, rather. Anyway, you've listened long enough. So the tactical tip of the day. The tactical tip of the day is the Civil Defense Force. For a long time, this nation had a Civil Defense Force. Sadly, it is not anymore, at least not on a national level. However, they produced a lot of content and material, much of which I believe is in the public domain. Much of it pertains to survival. Looking for resources, a lot of that stuff is free and in the public domain. Just look up you know, Civil Defense training films or things like that. Again, Civil Defense Force, Civil Defense, Civil Defense Films, things like that. One thing, and I'm not just saying this, I actually practice this with my wife just within the last couple of days. If you're in the survival community, that kind of thing, you probably have a tourniquet. Good, but this goes back to what we talked about, know how to use it. Your second tactical tip is bust out that tourniquet and practice with it. Have the skill, not just the knowledge like, yes, you probably understand how a tourniquet works. You may even have the tourniquet. If you not, if you cannot apply it in a timely manner, it's not going to help you. My wife and I practiced self-aid buddy aid with a tourniquet just not too long ago. I haven't done it in a while, and I'm TCCC trained and certified and all that. It had been probably longer than it should have been since I practiced those skills. This is a man that's had to use a tourniquet to save life. I still let it go longer than I should have without practicing that skill. So if you have a tourniquet, which if you're listening to this and you're in your survival, you probably do, practice with it. Grab a buddy, grab a spouse, grab a kid, and practice with the tourniquet. They'll probably think it's fun. Yeah, it's painful, but it's not going to kill you. You know, tourniquets don't go on necks, but you know, you practice on an arm or a leg. That's a quick, easy, and a lot of times fun thing. Not everybody in your family might be into the tactical, you know, aspects, but what about car accidents? They're probably aware that those things happen to most people. Probably not anti-tourniquet. I've never seen any political affiliation or anything that's anti-tourniquet. So practice your tourniquet training. If you have one, bust it out. Do it on yourself first. Make sure it's on tight enough. Make sure you know how to check that it's tight enough. and Make sure you can't feel a pulse and all those things. Then practice with a buddy. Show them how to use it if they don't know how. And then have them put it on you and put it on themselves. The whole ordeal might take 10 minutes. And it might save you or somebody else's life. So that's your second tactical tip of the day. Your tactical verse of the day. Hopefully what you've been waiting for. We talked a little bit about cities. Things like that today. We're called to be in the world, but not of the world, men. I'm going to read from you some 2 Corinthians. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you 
and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Notice God is gracious here. As we know from other scripture, God is rich in mercy. He wants a union with his people, but he calls them to action again, action, doing something. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. With that, men, as I was talking with the patrons earlier today, we think this culture is hostile to God, and it is. Look at the vast majority of culture today. It's disgusting, but it's nothing new. From Sodom and Gomorrah to Babylon to Egypt to Rome and the decadence and all those empires and all that culture come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. Likewise, Revelation 18. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. Be different. Be better. Be set apart. That's what holy means. Holy. Set apart. Different. Set apart unto God. Different from this culture in the world, but not of the world. Be a life ring, a lifesaver to those in that culture, dragging them out to be separate instead of drowning in it yourself. With that, men, thanks for listening. And have a blessed day.